I guess we're recording. Well, okay, here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response, session 110 in our series uh, began with the pandemic and a response to that global challenge, crisis that uh, that really shook the place up and it is still reverberating and it's actually still happening. Uh, our theme today is Reweaving the Web. That should be in quotes there because that's the title of the book that Richard Witt is going to tell us about. He's just published that, just released that book. What's wrong with the World Wide Web? Well, a number of things we'll find out. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open consortium of libraries doing what we think are interesting things with technology <laughs> anywhere. Uh, and our, our co-producer and host of the sessions, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague, uh, the head of public policy, Stephen Weiber, is at the helm there and recording the session for us today. Our series sponsor this year is IMLS, which we appreciate very much, Institute for Museum and Library Services. They do so much. Uh, our speaker, Richard, is um, I'll, I'll get to Richard, but he's the president of the GLIA Foundation, the head of the GLIA Alliance, which is the, the heart of his uh, approach. We're really anxious to hear about the details on it. Um, Richard says, since the mid-1990s, the web has connected billions, enabling information sharing, business entertainment. However, companies like Google and Facebook uh, prioritize surveilling us and extracting our data and manipulating behavior, leading to a mistrustful online environment filled with intrusive ads, misinformation, and harmful content. It's a it's a succinct and accurate statement. Uh, these companies started one way, but you know, it's just strange what hundreds of billions of dollars will do to your thinking. This is our go-to mantra image of the uh, the poor world dealing with these global challenges uh longing for the good old days of merely sweating out nuclear annihilation but we've we've started out of course at, in response to the declaration of the pandemic in march of 2020 and uh it keeps going on. I mean, it's still here. It's changed and how, you know, how, how people feel about it and the virus itself is more, but it's still out there. It's still dangerous. People are still contracting it. I myself had it two months ago for the second time and it's no fun. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are suffering mightily from it through this long COVID phenomenon, which is just really terrible, can be terrible. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that we have focused on quite a bit and more recently is the extreme weather events that are driven by climate change and, and, a, and a warmer atmosphere and warmer oceans. And this is a, this is a two-year-old statement from, from uh, IPCC that we have major changes that are inevitable and irreversible. That's, that should get people's attention. I think it does get a few people's attention, but just not doesn't seem like nearly enough. It's like somebody yells fire in the theater and, you know, a third of the people get up and the others just, you know, sit there and, until their their seat starts to smoke out or something. It's just a, some kind of loss of credibility of general information. I'm not sure what it is, but it's it's alarming because this stuff is real. Uh, this is our this is our happy collage of uh uh, major events uh, that are happening around the world. Uh, this is just a couple of weeks ago. This was a prediction of uh, the path of Helene, which exactly what it did and swept up through not, you know, didn't die at the coast like normal hurricanes do. It went on up the Appalachian Trail and devastated uh, uh, Western uh, North Carolina and left a trail of of water 
which is the other new thing. It's not just the speed of these storms, but the amount of water that they contain is so much greater. Uh, this is our little chart of progress of these uh, increase in these disasters. <clears throat> and you can see that they're, they're obviously climbing up. And then two years later, they're climbing more. They've changed the scale over there on the right side to measure this in, in uh, 50s of billions of dollars. And then this is the, the latest one. This is not, of course, including 2024. The two, Helene and uh, Milton, the, the last the last Florida hurricane, combined for an estimated $300 billion of, worth of damage. Now, you talk about unsustainable. We have very many of those. And you know, the insurance people are just running for the hills. The government is not, well... It acts like it's bottomless, but it's just not. So this is this is really something. And our point is not that you know people need to be aware that this is happening. Many people are aware, even if they don't really do much about it. But it's the it's the challenge of communities and the responses of libraries to these circumstances. Not that libraries can change the uh, the overall circumstance and do anything significant to mitigate it, but the flip side of that is adapting to these irreversible uh, changes uh, in times of crisis when disaster actually hits and libraries become second responders, as it were, uh, to crises of really every sort. Uh, and so preparing for that is, is a challenge because, you know, it didn't happen today. And we've got all these other things that are pressing on us. So we'll, it's a good idea. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that soon, we hope, but just not today. And then it happens. And then, you know, then the blank check comes out, whatever it costs, we need help today. And then after that, you know, depending on how the experience went, the investment comes, trails off at some point. But we're just suggesting that there are a few steps to harden the library uh, primarily with backup power, uh, which is a top need. But the actual number one need that people have in a disaster is communication. Where is everybody? Is everybody okay? Just consider the, the difference in the, in the amount of information and the amount of data in the message, mom, we're all okay. I mean, it's a tiny fraction of data, but it's a huge amount of information, something you'd pay almost anything for if you were in that circumstance. And libraries are there to provide communication if they have a backup strategy and a, a backup uh, energy supply because people's phones will run out. The cell systems are down usually in these large scale events. Uh, our latest crisis and the ones more relevant to our topic today is AI, a boon or doom. Well, the uh, jury is out on that. Uh, it's happening so quickly, though. We don't quite have a handle on it. Nobody has convinced us that they really know what's what it is and what's happening. Uh, that you know, it 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 could be utopian. It could be dystopian. I think those are both very credible scenarios. Uh, I'm not in the camp that it's not that it's nothing. I think it's it's a huge deal. Uh, it's a kind of a continuation of how the internet has been affecting everything since it arrived or arrived as the World Wide Web really in the '90s and assimilating prior media, I mean, newspapers and books and movies and everything. Uh, I mean, newspapers used to run on want ads. I mean. When was the last time you ran a want ad or even saw one? And, you know, they don't exist anymore. It's just Craigslist and all these kinds of things that make it just so, so easy. And uh, TV, finally, that was the real marker to me that, that the internet ate TV and people are cutting their cable, you know, right and left. It is streaming. You choose what you want, search for it. Of course, you'd be, your choices will be uh, aided by AI algorithms that will be tailored to your test tastes. Uh, but nevertheless, it's uh, uh, you know, peak TV seems to have passed, and now it's it's video over the internet, and so now the arrival of AI 
seems to be enclosing and assimilating the internet itself. The internet, which increasingly is being connected to everything. I mean, everything electronic anyway. And how that, how that all works and, and how that's managed is really a huge complex issue. But that makes it, it's, you know, all the infrastructure, electrical, gas, all these things have, have uh, uh, communications embedded in them. And of course, the intelligence and the, uh, and the monitoring systems that go along with that. So that communication system and now the, the, the intelligence embedded in that communication system is like, it's like a meta infrastructure, you know, the, the ring that binds them all. And I just can't think of anything that's just more important to how civilization operates than that. So this is a huge, huge deal. And to quote David Linder, the president of the Boston Public Library, AI is a huge harbinger of social change and libraries must be part of it. Amen, David. So we've, we've focused on this. It's been our most popular topic. Uh, there, we've done a couple more since this, since, uh, since session 95 on AI, and we're doing one again today. Uh, people are paying attention, and libraries seem like they really are getting that it's important, especially to them. You know, libraries are in the information business. This is information technology, for sure. So what does it mean? It's a really great question, and we're spending a lot of time exploring it. AI, hey, uh, the, <laughs> the doom side of this is interesting. Um, you know, we have these symbols for, for dangerous things, you know, that, uh, that come along poison and, uh, radiation. I remember this, uh, it was new when I came along and then, you know, biohazard, that one really freaked me out. I don't know. Uh, but now, you know, we've got AI and they can't really figure out what's the right symbol for AI hazard. So these are the two leading contenders or AI hazard. I'm not sure where you post it, but you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> so uh, Richard has been on several times with us before. This is one uh, uh, titled, If the Internet is Broken, How Can Libraries Fix It? And Ben Tarnoff had written uh, uh, this, this article, New York Times article, If the Internet is uh, Broken. And uh, came on and Richard was there to respond and talk about his work, which you can see he's continued today with the publication of his book, which deals with this very thing. So Richard, uh, welcome back. It's, it's great to see you. Uh, Richard and I have known each other for a good number of years now, and it's been a, a great association. Uh, he's, he's been our go-to guy on, on AI. He's, He's just on top of it, especially in these, these relevant uh, areas of, uh, of trust, which is absolutely a crisis. And another reason that, that it's especially important to libraries who have, uh, well, have a, a, a major asset in trust. They're extremely trusted and it suggests a responsibility. What, what, well, what are what will libraries do with this trust in this age of AI? Well, we're going to hear something about that right now from Richard Witt. Thank you, Richard. Please. Thank you, Don. Um, great to be back. Yeah, I I was trying to think back to when it was. Yeah, it was two plus years ago now that I joined you last. Um, great to be back. Um, and despite the title, um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on what's wrong with the World Wide Web. I'll go a little bit into it. But I think it's much more interesting to start talking about solutions and talking about at least proposed ways of getting out of the situation we're in. Uh, and my new book, um, uh, which Don alluded to, and I'll, again, be bringing up very, very briefly in, in, in my talk um, before discussing some of these proposals for solution sets, um, goes into that. So let me, without uh, further ado, I'll pull up my... Um, slide deck and let's see here we go slideshow and Great. Can see. okay okay uh whoops i'll go back a sec so this is about um essentially 
a couple of things intersecting here. So one of them is this new book, which I'll, again, I'll touch on very briefly. Um, and then my diagnosis of what I think is wrong with the web and what we can do to try to help fix it, which is this Gleonet um, initiative. And then the last part of my conversation is about this alliance of, of companies that have brought together, I'm very excited about, um, who are working to create that sort of trustworthy ecosystem. So more than just discussing in terms of um, you know, potentialities and, and, and far-flung futures, it's trying to build something like right now. Um, so um, what's this all about a new book? <laughs> uh, let me actually move this out of the way. Can you see the full screen? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is it. Um, <laughs> it is a, 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 a something that I've been working on for, for quite a while. Um, and I'm very pleased to finally have it out in the world. Um, it is, whoops, I don't know why the, keep hitting this very, there we go. Um, so it is, uh, it is an attempt to look at the history of the World Wide Web and the internet, um, collectively and come up with some, uh, some thoughts about what's wrong, but as I said, more importantly, what's right. Um, and so it is attempt to create this new ecosystem I call Gleonet. The, there's the website. You can also find it on Amazon. Um, don't blame me for the fact that the hardback book costs $52. That is Amazon's policies, which I think is completely crazy. Um, and, uh, I had, I had zero ability to change that, but the, the paperback is 27. It's just as nice. I would highly recommend you get that one instead. If you're interested in getting the book, um, that's the version I would, I would, uh, I would suggest. So what's this thing called Gleonet? Um, and, uh, so in, in simple terms, this is the one slide that where I attempt to bring together what I think of as the the, the challenges, the problems, the the root causes of the problem of the issues we have with the web today. I call it the seam cycle. Um, a fair amount of this is represented by Shusana Zuboff and her her great work on surveillance capitalism and many other people. But I, I thought it's it was worthwhile to think about this not just as sort of particular elements of business models, but actually this extremely robust and long lasting set of feedback loops that the web companies, including my alma mater, Google, have put together over the last several decades. Um, the surveillance part, 30 billion devices, we're now edging towards 35 and it's, it goes up all the time. Um, these are devices that are in our homes. <laughs> Many of them we invite in willingly as part of our laptops and, and, uh, and cell phones, and then of course security systems and on and on and on. Uh, but increasingly, the IoT smart city environment, the, the communities we live in, we've got these, these devices everywhere. Um, and what they do is they surveil us. They surveil us in a vast number of ways. And again, the book goes into that in more detail. I, I won't really dwell on that here. The second piece of that is extraction. So it's data, what they call data, which, um, again, a longer conversation. Um, but they, they view us as, as repositories of, of information to them that has commercial value. And that's pretty much the extent of it from these large web platform companies and this vast ecosystem that they support of data marketers, advertisers, publishers, brokers. There's just this whole undersea of these folks uh, who want to take this data from us. Why? Because they want to analyze it. Um, and as Don mentioned, you know, we're in the age of AI, but we've had these algorithms for decades now um, in the web, in our networks, again, on our phones, laptops. Um, an algorithm is nothing new. It's just, we've been now in this era of exponential growth, explosive growth in terms of what these algorithms can, can accomplish most recently with generative AI and large language models and then manipulation, which when I first started talking about this in 2018, the same year I left Google, some people raised an eyebrow and said, well, that that seems a, a bit strong, isn't it, Richard? But I think in the six years since it's only become more obvious that that is in fact, what's happening. You can use the term influence that that makes you feel better. Um, but it ultimately it is an, they, they are they want to take this data they want to spend all this all these vast resources right this takes a ton of money to do this um, but they do it because they want to try to influence just to do something to change the way we think to change the way we act in the world influencing us to buy products services candidates lifestyles etc and the upshot of this is that you know this paradigm is is what it is it's it's what the the web companies have successfully built and successfully utilized um, for the last 10 to 20 years. 
So if we want to do something about this, there are a number of ways we can, and there are a number of folks trying to attack the paradigm uh, by trying to require greater accountability, more transparency. In the realm of AI, for example, we talk about these guardrails that are intended to essentially fence off the more extreme cases, uh, potential existential risks coming from uh, these brand new AI models. Um, but my approach is a little different. It's to say, fine, we should do that. Absolutely. We have to have accountability, responsibility, transparency on the big guys. But I'm actually more interested in doing something a little different, which is building the alternative paradigm, a parallel web, as, as it might be thought of. Um, that is that is based on, and again, Don touched on this, that's actually based on trust. So my proposal is called Glianet. Um, it's, uh, Glia comes from the ancient Greek word for glue. Um, as it says here, you know, I chose this for three reasons. Um, initially, you know, is this the old saying, trust is the social glue. Trust clearly is breaking down in so many of our institutions, unfortunately. This has been, you know, not a, a near-term phenomenon. It's been going on for quite a while. The web certainly didn't uh, create that uh, lack of trust, but it has absolutely exacerbated it in many ways in our political systems, our economic systems, social systems, all the different ways that we interact with each other. The institutions around have, have really all, I think, across the board suffered uh, from this lack of trust. And um, so what do you think we're going to do here to try to take on the web and the seams paradigm it has to begin and be rooted in trust? Um, accountability is the second element of this. With great power comes great responsibility, as Uncle Ben told uh, Peter Parker, the young Spider-Man. Those that power in tech tend not to answer for it, so we need to sort of glue that back together. And then the third, and the one I really kind of I'm entranced by, is this idea of the glial cells in the brain. These are supposedly inert elements of matter that um, in the late 19th century, when they first could see the neurons with the electric sig signals in the brain, they, they saw this dark stuff in between that didn't carry those same signals. And they said, well, this must be doing something. It must be gluing the neurons together. And that's where the, the term glial actually came about. As it turns out, they were carrying chemical signals, not electronics. So they weren't actually seen by the particular equipment the, the researchers were using. But it also turns out that they do a whole lot of things to protect and enhance and promote all the healthy neural functions. I really like that as an analogy, and I like I also like to say walking around here in Silicon Valley, where I live today, um, and go to you know happy hour or whatever, you see tons of neurons everywhere. You don't see a whole lot of gleals hanging around, and so I think that's that that notion of actually supporting people along with trust and accountability, I think, have to be built into whatever you're trying to to accomplish here. And then it's also an acronym for for some other things as well. So this is the trust fabric uh, notion, a layered approach towards. Uh, trying to build this alternative ecosystem. At the very top of it is governance. It's it's the human factor, right? So it's developing policies and practices uh, in the web. And I use the, the, the shorthand D greater than A, and that stands for digital uh, and means in this case, digital rights, digital autonomy, digital agency should be greater than what we have in the analog world. If we're gonna have technology, it makes little sense to have it if it's actually keeping us sort of where we are are much more obviously, as we've seen today, unfortunately, takes us back where we actually have fewer rights in the web and fewer opportunities to express our autonomy and agency in, in unfettered ways than we do in the analog space. And so we need to sort of reverse that. And my proposal here is to go back to the common law of fiduciaries, um, doctors, lawyers, many types of um, uh, agents in our lives uh, have been assigned these duties because they have certain power asymmetries over us. Um, usually it's based on expertise that we lack, and it's also based on confidences that we share with them. And so I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but this notion of a new class of what I call net fiduciaries uh, should be a grounding principle, a place that people can put their trust. Then we need to have markets of folks who are willingly sellers and buyers, which I would submit today's version of capitalism uh, or the marketplace is not actually not that. It's tilted too far in one direction towards the platform players and not enough towards a more healthy sense of what a market can look like. The technology layer, the third piece is using what I call edge tech uh, applications. Those are things that live on the edge, which means they give us more control over our daily experiences. Here I use the short term E to A, which stands for edge to any. Um, it's intended to be a bit of a tongue in cheek take on the end to end principle, which is E to E, which is the highlight of the internet. Which, was, which of course came about in the 70s and 80s, was the precursor to the web. And then Sir Tim Berners-Lee came along with the web 
built that overlay on top of it, on of, of the net. Um, and that's unfortunately where much of the trouble starts. And that's, again, the book goes into more detail around that. And even Sir Tim himself has recognized that and is trying to make amends in his own way with his solid project. And then finally, public policy. How do you facilitate creating inputs and incentives to create these new kinds of innovations? So net fiduciary, um, it is this entity that's your personal agent. Uh, as a bona fide fiduciary, uh, under the, the common law, understanding what that means, so that includes, among other things, duties of care, good faith, confidentiality, and loyalty. The template is existing professionals like doctors and lawyers. Um, but frankly, you know, we've seen, particularly in this, in, an example of, of doctors, um, they are conflicted oftentimes. If they have to deal with managed care situations, for example, or getting pressure to prescribe one pharmaceutical versus another based on you know, certain pecuniary interests, those are really challenging. So part of what I want to do is understand better those pressures because similar pressures come to bear when it comes to, for example, protecting somebody's personal data. How do you do that? How do you ensure it's only being shared in the right way with, with legitimate consent uh, from the individual involved. And then the net part means, again, all these different elements online, not just personal data, to be clear, because a lot of folks talk about limiting to, to data, but it's also it gets into the, as it turns out, the context of AI and the algorithmic decision making that's happening all around us uh, and on us. Um, so this is the idea of the PEP model. Um, the PEP model, uh, whoops, sorry, um, uh, which stands for Protect, Enhance, and Promote. The idea is to align this with the three different duties of care that we've seen in the common law. Uh, the duty of care, uh, sorry, the duty of care means no harm. Uh, the duty of fidelity, as I call it, means no conflicts of interest. And the duty of loyalty, which is the highest level, um, means to promote the best interests of the individual. So I call these functions the protect, enhance, and promote, hence the, the PEP. The roles there, guardian, mediator, advocate, um, and examples um, I'm really sorry. I don't know why I keep doing that. The examples there go to um, uh, protecting the client's data in the case of a care. So sort of building a, a wall, a virtual wall around an individual and really trying to make sure that they are, they're fully protected. Um, on the duty of fidelity side, it's mediating the news feeds for somebody. So it's sort of sitting in the middle. Um, so the things that algorithms are doing for you, it gives you an opportunity to, to decide for yourself what those should look like. Um, and then an example of the loyalty is something that uh, uh, Doc Searles has called intent cast shopping, which means uh, you have sort of a virtual shopping cart you take to every website and it's yours, nobody else's, all your information is in there, super secret, super secure. You only share that information if you so desire with any particular um, uh, website or application. So those are sort of the three examples. Uh, here's one way to think about it. Um, it's the net fiduciary. Uh, so that's, you know, the entity and then an example of edge tech, which we can talk about obviously at, at greater length, if you like in the Q and a, which is what I call the authentic personal AI agent. Uh, we're hearing so much about AI agents today. If last year, 2023 was year of LLMs, 2024 is the year of the agent for sure. And we're seeing obviously countless examples of that. One that I find particularly amusing is Microsoft, uh, with Copilot. Um, a brilliant marketing strategy by somebody. They should get a raise, uh, a big promotion for that. Um, the notion of the co-pilot sounds really enticing, right? I'm sitting right up there in, in the pilot seat, right along that agent. Um, as Cory Doctorow, I think, somewhat snidely remarked, but I think it's probably accurate. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm sitting in steerage. I'm not in the pilot seat, right? They're the ones in charge. They have all the data. They have the control situation vis-a-vis -vis me, and the, the, you know, the actions happening on my behalf. Um, and so in order to sort of change that dynamic, another term people have used is the double agent, right? So it's an agent you think is working for you, but all of the machinery, things in the back end, the terms of service, um, the privacy policies, all that is being written by these, the, the companies, the web companies slash AI companies to benefit themselves and not, not you, um, at least directly. So we need an authentic agent, one that is representing us that with the help of a, of a net fiduciary, for example, then can turn around and interact with all these other different players, what I call the institutional AI. So we need our own AI, not a co-pilot, but an, uh, an, you know, a, a, a tool that in turn can interact with co-pilot, basically tell co-pilot what we want it to do rather than the other way around. So this is an example of sort of how you combine the governance and the technology um, structures together. Um, in the book, uh, the last 
So the book, basically the first part talks about some of the challenges, the seam cycles, as I said, part two is around governance. So this gets into the, the common law of fiduciaries is my proposed approach um, to trying to deal with this, this massive trust deficit in technology. Part three is around the technology. And then part four is, okay, great. If you are along the ride so far, you think there's some, some, some good stuff there. How do we get there from here? So I wanted to make this a very action oriented approach. So I put my cards on the table. I lay out a provisional theory of change, how you get there from here. Not surprisingly, it lines up more or less to the different layers I, I mentioned previously. So the private governance side, it's finding companies, as I call coalitions of the willing to become these fiduciaries in the world. It's very important that this notion of loyalty not be something that is forced. Forced loyalty is no loyalty at all. If this becomes a compliance regime for, let's say, Mark Zuckerberg to try to meet, he'll do the minimum necessary. Instead, it has to be companies who see the value in serving this role, um, the, the commercial value, which I actually believe is very real over time, could even uh, exceed the value that the web companies get because you're getting a legitimate relationship, not a series of transactions. You're getting uh, an ability to work with somebody to build trust. That trust builds the right kind of feedback loops where I share data with you, information, my future intentionalities. The company can help me. Uh, and in turn, that, that trust level just, just ri you know, keeps rising and that sharing produces more and more value for both sides. So I really do think it's a, a legitimate commercial um, opportunity, not just uh, sort of a doing good. It obviously can and would do good in the world, but doing so in a market-based approach. The tech design there is, is again, these, these E2A tool, compliant tools, including these agents. The governance can be done with using policymakers doing certain things around this. We don't really get into that much today. And then the social fabric. I think the number one thing here is to raise expectations. We've all sort of gotten used to this, the, the tired mantra coming out of Silicon Valley, like stop worrying about your personal data, stop worrying about your privacy, it's gone. You can't do anything about it. Just basically give in. Um, and that's completely wrong. We've had this web in place for one generation, essentially. Um, there's And there's nothing about it that's inevitable. And there's also nothing about it that says that the data they have today is gonna stay meaningful forever. In fact, you know, we all are all changeable, evolving human beings. The longer we live, the more things we do in this world, the more experience we gain, the richness of all of that. Um, I, I, I would submit a lot of that can't be tapped to and it is not being tapped into by the platform companies because they have a very narrow conception of us as, as users and, and folks from whom they want to extract this information to make money. So I think there's a, there's a, vast, a vast array of opportunities out there for people who want to do something different than the current web. And then here's some ideas on where this could actually go in the long term uh, and my, my suggestion of a metric for success in roughly seven years or so. And finally, um, what is this about this new alliance? So I alluded to this briefly, um, this coalition of companies, and it's true. So I've, I've put together, it's a coalition so far, 19 different companies based in Silicon Valley, but they're also scattered around Canada, the UK and Australia. They do a variety of things um, involving social media, uh, data protection. There's an IoT company. There's three AI companies. And the, the, what binds them is they all see this sort of vision about wanting to do something different, wanting to have an ethical business model um, that offers a market differentiator from what the web is today. And they see real legitimate, legitimate commercial value there. So this Gleonet Alliance is an attempt to pull these folks together and then build something with that. And what does that look like? Well, this real quickly is, is the roadmap that I've put together. Uh, you know, phase one, the formation, we're pretty much there. We've got the charter, the statement of principles, we're, the membership structure is coming together. We're now developing frameworks, including you saw the theory of change earlier, the PEP alignment model and that roadmap. Those are all things we've got agreement uh, at, with, with in terms of the membership. Phase three is the heart of this. The next two years, what I want to do is build an actual community of practice that looks at things like business models, company policies and practices, technical standards, et cetera. Uh, and then at some point, you know, perhaps around year three, we even move into something called professionalization, which is, this could be a, a, a legitimate self-regulating organization, maybe even a profession. Um, I don't want to prejudge that, but that is at least a potential outcome. If the community of practice elements go well, um, that's where I would love, a, love to, uh, love for this, uh, this alliance to end up. 
Um, this is the the mission. It's the it's building. Oh gosh, I need to keep doing that. I'm sorry. Um, oh no, I see what's going on. It's telling me that I'm pushing on there. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> that's the that's the mission. Um, uh, anchored by the trusted intermediaries and the, these edge tech capabilities, such as the authentic agents. Um, and then in for those to join up, which is it's a free membership, you just have to agree that you're going to be uh, committed to working with the other uh, folks in a collaborative manner. Um, and so these are the principles is acknowledging certain things you're um, that the, you know, that the seems paradigm is, is that is real. You're embracing the notion of ethical business practices. You're committed to exploring and applying different corporate governance elements. You welcome collaboration. Uh, you want to design a number of these things, professional codes of conduct and best practices, for example, um, maybe eventually some sort of a certification or licensing regime if this moves into sort of phase four. What's the public policy positioning look like around that? There's some interesting things around AI interoperability. For example, do we build open standards so that AI systems can talk to each other, not reliant on APIs, which is the preferred approach the platforms have to connect with their systems, but an actual standard where, where AI agents can freely interact with each other and with the platforms, you know, what would that look like? Um, so we're up to, we have so far 20 members. We will cap it at 30 because I think that makes the most sense in terms of something that um, will allow us to work together, uh, have a healthy representation, but not get too unwieldy. With other partners and stakeholders, uh, it'll be a nonprofit 501c6. Initial funding coming from foundations um, matched to academic expertise. So I'm talking with my alma mater, Georgetown University, um, the law center there, the business school, the ethics lab, uh, the computer science department, and a few others there um, trying to build sort of a robust ecosystem of academic support that in turn can provide inputs into this process. The models I've already showed you, basically the theory of change and then the PEP model uh, to really test it out. How does this work? Uh, this based on this initial assessment of common law, how do ethical duties really align with daily practices and, and policies? I think that's you know, where the rubber hits the road. How do you make that work? Does it work in the real world? Do you need to modify it? Does it? And those are the kinds of, I think, hard questions we want to ask and hopefully answer. Um, some projects here to, around the PEP model. And again, I won't really get into much detail there because I want to save time for questions. The community practice defining that um, in a way that many other uh, sets of, of ecosystems and stakeholders have done in other spaces um, that I'm familiar with. So taking some of those, um, those learnings and understanding what that means to sort of create this domain of knowledge to convene these practitioners and develop, you know, develop this as a practice. Uh, here's some of the elements. Um, again, we can talk in more detail, but it's really trying to do this across the board and all the different pieces that would, that any any company who wants to operate in the space would find useful. So creating these templates and uniform approaches that can can help fill in the gaps for them as they're trying to uh, continue developing their businesses, um, and then professionalization potentially. As I mentioned, you know, some sort of uniform code of conduct, trade association, perhaps trust marks, licensing, that sort of thing. Uh, this is a member, a lot of names there, but these are the companies um, that are listed and probably not very helpful to you all. But uh, one of them I'll, I'll point out is um, Consumer Reports. So they're the one, everybody else is pretty much a, a, a relatively small startup. Consumer Points join because they are very interested in being that trusted intermediary. And so we are working on how they could potentially serve that role. And many of these companies in turn can provide sort of on a white label approach, uh, a number of the functionalities that they would find um, useful in terms of, uh, you know, presenting themselves to the ordinary consumer as a trusted intermediary, as a net fiduciary. Um, and then this finally just tries to take all those different folks and puts them in a roughly forward layered approach. So a number of them work on the content side such as social media platforms. A number of them are applications at the second layer. A lot of them do things at the logical layer, um, including building out uh, security and, and data protection, proof of governance uh, elements. And then there's the physical, which is the IoT, which is helpful places doing uh, some really cool work with an open source uh, standard for people as they interact with their environments in a number of cities around, around the world. Um, and I'm the head of this brand new thing. I've got a great director of community engagement and outreach and advisor, strategic advisor, and then legal counsel um, based in Washington. 
So anyway, that's a real quick overview. I hope I didn't go over too much over time there, Don. Not a bit. A taste of Not a bit over time. Uh, just <laughs> overboard, maybe. I mean, Rick, <laughs> you've laid you've laid out projects that's just daunting to to think about. I mean, you you're you're crossing all the institutional boundaries of of private, nonprofit, public, all the national boundaries. It obviously is a global uh, environment that we're in. And uh, and trying to literally weave those functions together uh, into something really sounds like it would be valuable, really valuable. Uh, the 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 anchor for me that drives this need is the um, is is the lack of trust in these big companies, which are very clearly you know, commercial enterprises and profit driven. So that's what they do. And they, they can't, they can't really be held responsible for not being socially responsible <laughs> because they're not engineered that way. I mean, they should be a little more than they are, but they, they won't, they won't change this. This guardrail concept has always been just kind of, you know, a metaphor yeah. of the most remote <laughs> applicability. Right. <laughs> What could be more different from AI than a than a a thing along the road that you know keeps you from driving over the cliff? Um, but a, a a couple of well, one thing that that really hit that 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 lack of trust for me was the this uh, documentary a few years ago, the Social Dilemma, a Netflix documentary. It must be six years old now, but it it's. I haven't watched it again, but it still feels fresh. It's these, you know, just how these algorithms are designed and how they work and how they, how they change behavior and, and thinking. And so I was curious about this mediation you were suggesting that this intermediary does, this trusted intermediary. Uh, I mean, we're already kind of mediating our own, let's say, just say news feeds. We can leave shopping aside for a moment. Uh, it's a type of shopping. Uh, so we're doing that. So are, are we going to give instruction to our intermediary on how to mediate the <laughs> mediation? I mean, how are they going to, how are they going to understand what we want? Right. Well, um, so obviously we have mediaries today, right? It is, I mean, we do our own in, in, in the world all the time, right? So mediation is sort of a no normal part of our biological process. What's changed in the last few decades is, is I think it's increasing, is that the sources of information, entertainment, news, all of that online is being mediated for us by others, right? So the algorithm that, that tells me, okay, you love that movie, you're really going to love this one. Right. Um, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. What, what was the thinking process behind it? Did they think I, it's really a, a perfect match for my personality or did somebody pay them to stick that in there because they think, oh, I'll just sit there. I'm a couch potato. I'll watch another two hours. What the hell? Um, so the issue here is who is mediating for you? Because it will. And it's inevitable. Life is, you know, we're busy. We're short of time. Um, we, we want that mediation in the world. Um, and the question is, who will do it? There's a great there's a concept that's now becoming part of a number of these companies called middleware. Um, and Stanford university has been doing some research on it. There's some companies, a few of them are in my little coalition. The idea is these are what they call decision engines. So algorithms make decisions. And when they make decisions on our behalf, we should have a right to be a part of that, that sort of loop of decisions. Um, yeah. This can happen obviously in non-commercial context. So, you know, things like, did I get that job? Uh, what, you know, what's that diagnosis in terms of my health? How long is my prison sentence? I mean, these are all things that have popped up, you know, in very, in very uh, important and uh, crucial ways as conversation points. But that's also happening in, in the world that we live in more, more daily in the commercial world. So the middleware notion is we have the, we should have the right to substitute our decision engines for somebody else's. So let's say news. If there's a news feed, that Mark Zuckerberg has decided this is this is the news feed. This is the right one. And maybe he says, you know what? I don't like Al Jazeera. I think that these guys are terrorists. I'm not going to let them be in that news feed. You're only going to get this. And maybe it's the Wall Street Journal and a few other things. So maybe it reflects a certain perception of the world. Of course, that carries through in the news we read. And that creates its own sort of social bubble that we inhabit 
It's his bubble, though, not ours. So I hear a lot of people say, well, if you let people have this sort of mediation approach and put them in charge, aren't they going to create their own bubbles? Yeah, perhaps, at least initially. But first off, it's your bubble, not somebody else's. And then second, I think if you come from a place of trust where you know you feel like you're in an environment where the sources that you're able to get at are things that you feel good about, I think that also helps you over time start to lower the barriers a bit to say, you know what? I'm really curious about that news feed or that mm -hmm. movie or that piece of art or whatever it is, because I come from a more secure place. I'm more willing to explore the world. Um, again, this is a, just a theory, but I think there's a good number of psychologists who would say that's sort of the way we tend to interact in the world. We come from a place of security. When you're insecure, then you hold in tight. And that's, I think, where a lot of these bubbles, unfortunately, creates some of these extreme dynamics and behaviors in society. So if you build the trust initially, the security level, then people can use that sort of exploration of the world and get out from the bubble, as it were. So again, that's a thesis, but I think it's uh, at least something worth, you know, within obviously my little, my little um, alliance, but, but hopefully across as these other different approaches to the web are, are sort of popping up, other people can experiment with. It's a great thesis and a hopeful one as well. And, uh, uh, it would be terrific if, if that did allow people to uh, loosen up, to uh, experience things that would be new and, you know, uh, otherwise threatening to them. Uh, we want to talk about, of course, the library's role in trust, but I want to, we'll get to that. But I, uh, the, it's just like Beverly had the question too. I saw her. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, I'll take, go to Beverly just right away here, but I, I wanted to ask about uh the you give the example of doctors and lawyers yeah uh, and yes that's a clear you know trust relationship those are also expensive services yes. so how do you charge for this i mean what's the fee structure for a uh for a ai fiduciary or you know how do you old, right in the old days uh you'd say well yeah yeah you pay for it maybe it's 40 or 50 dollars a month i don't know maybe less maybe more um, you know, these days you'd say, well, no, I just pay for it with my data. It's all free. Everything's free on the web. So let's do that. Um, that is obviously one of the, the, the key, the linchpins here is, is payment. One is it's something that consumers, ordinary people would willingly pay for Two, can they pay for it? Right. So it's also economic means, not just sort of interest and desirability of these services. Those are both really crucial questions. Um, and a lot of what I want to do within this community practice for the next few years is really, really push into that and, and see, like, you know, for example, you could have something where it's a very modest fee up front and then every transaction or interaction you have with the web, then maybe you're paying a little bit of something for that. Um, mm. and, um, so that could be sort of like a, it's a pay to play. And if, but if you're not using the service a whole lot, then maybe it's a very modest, like a connection fee or something. And then nothing more than that. You mm. could also see a situation where, um, as sharing your information, your data, and if the intermediary helps you make a particular transaction, let's say makes a hotel reservation for you, right? Um, maybe that that itself incurs. Maybe there's a there's uh -huh. a deferring of costs there, right? And maybe the hotel pays a dollar or something for that happening, and maybe the intermediary gets fifty cents of that or something. So I think there's a really interesting way once you get out of the paradigm of the current web. Um, then I think it opens up these opportunities to explore these models. Ultimately, I think you will find, you know, a lot of people are going to need economic assistance to make this work. So this talks about maybe a government subsidy. Maybe you put a tax on online advertising, right? Um, do something similar to the Universal Service Fund we have for, um, you know, for broadband. Maybe it's the Universal Fiduciary Service Fund and maybe it's whatever... Uh -huh. People have vouchers and they can go use the vouchers and go hunt and find an intermediary they like and get maybe some compensation from the government for that. So um, excellent question. N most of this has yeah. not been worked out yet, but at least I think it's there's room here to have these kinds of conversations. And hopefully some of these companies are actually starting to put these services in the world. They can give us some some actual data and, and evidence as to whether and how it works. Yeah, I, I, I like the idea of embedding it in, uh, in transactions to benefit both sides of the transaction. Right. Because if it's just me being more secure, I'm I'm skeptical because people will just are just giving away all this information for just the slightest convenience. So there's no strong record that people are 
uh, so worried about their privacy in, in large numbers. It's a it's a, it's right. kind of a strange thing that we've lost track of. So uh, let's let's get to Beverly. Uh, Beverly, would you like to ask this question out loud? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I don't even I don't know if I'm uh, missing something somewhere or whatever, but I'm I'm thinking of this in terms of information services for libraries, right? Um, one of the things that I have noticed is on my own uh, interactions with, you know, the web, okay, Google, you've got Google, you, you pointed out three, three examples, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, I think. Mm -hmm. So one of the things with Google anyway, that I've noticed over the years is that it's, it, you know, it has changed, it has evolved, and the the sources of information seem to be harder and harder to find the quality services, you know, so that you are like basically inundated with with ads and inundated with, you know, what AI seems to think you want. It's kind of like what my question is kind of like reference based, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because I feel like the average person is not getting the benefit of you know, quality information. And uh, I guess I get that from, you know, my my old fashioned uh, education in libraries where we had um, things like News Bank and, um, you know, Just Store, some of these online databases where that information is. And it seems like that, you know, like I can't get to anything in the middle. It's either pay an exorbitant amount of money to have access to these really high academic databases or be inundated with all of these ads, you know? So what I'm getting from you is that, and I always think this myself, wouldn't it be great if I had more control over <clears throat> what's being fed to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I don't know if that's where you're headed with this or if that, it's, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely part of the it. lay sure. person, the lay librarian, the lay person who's not really... Technology is not my area of expertise, but I am a person who is interested in providing um, factual, accurate, and quality information to my clients and my patient and my patrons. So. Right. Thank you, Beverly. So that's definitely a part of it, um, Beverly. And uh, I know from my experience at Google, I mean, there's there has been this this uh, evolution. Maybe it's a de-evolution. Originally, Google was, you know, organizing the world's information and make it easy and accessible for people. Mm -hmm. That was that was the mission. Uh, and I think, you know, one could argue they did a pretty good job of it. Um, but a lot of it was you put your question in and then you had a series of links. Right. And the links were more or less stacked based on what they thought was the most relevant information for you. So you clicked on the link and you you went to the source. Right. You went to the article. You went to the whatever the place was, the website that that information was contained. Well, over time, there was fewer of those links that were the organic links. More of them were ad supported or ad sponsored, and they tended to migrate towards the top. So then you start clicking onto things that may or may not be factually accurate or exactly what you're looking for. More recently, Google has started this thing. I think they call it summaries, which is now they're, they're getting rid of the links. So they're basically summarizing for you sort of in Wikipedia style, but without all the footnotes. Mm -hmm. um, they're summarizing yeah. for you what the information is. So they're one, you're dependent on them to actually be making the right call, but two, you're losing access to all the organic links underlying that. So you could do your own research and figure out whether that's true or not. Um, it's controversial and Google has indicated, you know, they're sort of rethinking it, but, but that is, yeah. that is where they are headed. And I'll just mention real quickly. Now the next step is AI. So now we're in the world where AI right. using the web is taking all the information, quote unquote, Right, yeah. which could be from the most pure to the most, you know, the the lousiest, oh. and then they're making all these all these answers given to us without much yeah. of seeing behind the curtain, as it were. Yeah. So one of my examples, really quick, and then I, uh, you know, because yeah. I know it might be off topic, but is so uh, there was this question of um, policy in libraries in New Hampshire recently that came up in discussion about whether or not it was legal to have open carry in libraries, right? And mm -hmm. um, I thought, you know, for sure, when I was working in Florida, we 
guns were not allowed in the library. There was, I know, I read our policy and the policy was clear, no guns in the library. So I'm thinking, well, this, you know, we have to fix this, you know, we have to get guns out of libraries. So I Googled it and what came up was AI. And in the AI, it said that guns, it was illegal to carry guns in Florida libraries, right? That's what the AI summary was. Hmm. But in reality, that was not true. So the AI is not giving me the correct information because I, yes. you know, I subsequently did more research. But even the research that that I wanted to get was so bad. You know, like I had I got one one research paper from 2015, you know, nothing current, you know, that I could. You know, I mean, I'm I'm pretty good at Googling and, uh, you know, search, you know, doing my search, you know, using the right terminology. We don't do Boolean searches or anything like that anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's if a fiduciary would do something like, if a fiduciary would do something like, you know, incorporate, you know, and I wonder about this, like, so. If I want to get good information, I have to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the mm -hmm. Boston Globe, the Concord Monitor. I can't afford those um, right. individual. And more and more libraries, I don't see them, uh, at least in New Hampshire, subscribe to like, you know, public libraries. I, the state library may have something, but um, there's no news bank there's no news source you know I, so okay beverly, beverly we're, we're right. coming close okay. to the close to the I'll end be done. i'm done i'm but, done but no you, you touch on an important distinction between sort of intent you know commercial intent distorting the information and just just faulty information that ai is is generating i went to a talk last night for, uh by neil stevenson and he was looking up to see where his venue was going to be and it showed a place that he had talked in 2018 and, and he made the point, well, now that's part of the official record that AI is now reading. And it'll be, you know, remembered that way, misremembered that way. So mm. there's, that's another layer of this uh, difficulty that needs mediation. So let's, let's get to the, to the crux of this, uh, Richard, how, how do you see libraries playing in this, uh, intermediary role. It seems like they have all the many skills yeah. and trust and so forth that would that would people would want. They would naturally go to yeah. for that kind of help. Well, when I spoke uh, two and a half years ago on this program, I was trying to find the slide because it had something where I summed up. I think like six or seven points that indicated, you know, and that that was sort of in the earlier days of my thought process. But I think it's absolutely the case today. I think libraries could do a crucial role here for in a number of different manners, right? For starters, as you mentioned, you know, this is expensive stuff, but a library as an anchor institution of information uh, in, in, in a local community, maybe that could fill sort of the the gap. And we, you and I have been talking a bit, Don, about sort of public AI, right? The public option. Maybe libraries could be, in a sense, the public option where the community is agreed. This is a place anybody can go to and receive some, some at least some basic tools and ways of shaping their own online experiences, maybe working with some fiduciaries, maybe becoming one themselves. Um, I, I feel like, and then some of these tech companies could offer up the tools in ways that, you know, people again can utilize. Um, so I think, I think there's a really interesting potential role for libraries here as a, one of the uniquely trusted institutions. Most of the other institutions are sort of in tatters right now in terms of the trust levels that ordinary people have. I think libraries are still going strong. And so I, I you know, I think there's a, way to leverage that in, in the right kinds of ways to become even more relevant uh, in, in, in the, the new web. So you mean like instead of me uh, purchasing my personal intermediary, uh, intermediary, a library could in fact create a sort of a trusted public intermediary that I could use. Yeah. Uh, it, like we, you know, like the library model that right. uh, they acquire resources and then they share them. Uh, that could be, it wouldn't be exactly me, but it would be something that had been curated and I could trust that more than anything else. Right. And Beverly mentioned, I mean, 
I would pay good money myself if I had a single news feed that combined what I considered, let's just say, the half dozen most trusted sources. I'd rather not have to get subscriptions to every one of them. Uh, that that right. you know, that's just you know, that's just not really feasible. But if someone would give me that, I would pay something, and so maybe that could go into some sort of fund to you know to help support these news gathering organizations, journalists, investigative reporters. Right, the heart and soul of what we need is a democracy. And right. maybe the library can facilitate that. So maybe you all could help bring that feed together to where you are and then offer that as an application or or some way for people then to be able to use that as, as you know, everybody will have their own trusted sources, but it can be sort of the, the ground truth for an awful lot of people. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, that sounds, that sounds possible anyway. It definitely sounds <laughs> something desirable. Uh, it doesn't have to be a substitute, but rather a compliment. Like you're pointing out, public AI is right. another complementary approach, which we've talked about here. We won't get into it now, but it it really needs all approaches to because this is a really big deal. We're to be assumed by this stuff, we're drowned in misinformation and you know misguided intent, if I can put it that way. Uh, right. uh, unless unless we do something and just nailing up some steel guardrails somewhere. I just don't think they're going to cut it. I think we've got to no. get a little more sophisticated with it. So this is so. great. Uh, so yeah. any last word, Richard? I'll just, I'll just summarize it. The web, um, it's there's amazing stuff there, right? The technologies uh, are still impressive. AI, hugely impressive. But their, their approach is cart before the horse, right? It's like, here's the technology. Now trust us. And I, my point is, no, we got to go back to the human factors. We need to start with trust and all of the reasons why someone or something is trustworthy, all the relevant factors, and then you layer the technology on top of it. So you start with the human being rather than start with the technology. If anything, I think that's the one thing I would suggest is the is the thing that the approach that needs to be um, switched around or altered in, in, a, in a new web. Well, let's keep this conversation going and keep exploring how, how libraries can play in this because someone has to, and I just can't see there's, it leaves librarians out of the picture because this yeah. is what they do. They are the human factor, uh, live humans in a, in a, in a digital world. So once you get these ideas, go get my book, $27 on Amazon for the paperback. Um, Richard it's Witt. to be accessible and, and readable and good ideas there. But yeah, thank you very much, Don, for, for having me join today. Richard Witt, Reweaving the Web. Keep on reweaving, Richard. We'll <laughs> okay. talk to you soon. All right. Okay, let's close Thanks, the recording Don. here. I'm going to try. Appreciate your time.